My ancestors in France were serfs. They were peasants toiling for their lord. I didn't want to be a farmer like my grandpa, so I went to college and I got the idea that if I studied hard, I could make a better living for myself. Also, I got the notion that if I didn't like the French president, I would just vote for the other guy or even run for the job myself because, after all, this was my country. Well, all these ideas may seem obvious to you, like upward social mobility, representative democracy, the nation state, but they were not obvious as late as the 1700s. Uh, in fact, when we studied the colonization of the Caribbean in the last section, we studied societies based on slavery and monarchy. Well, the changes that brought us from then to now, they are the product of a fascinating era in the age of Atlantic revolutions. The Enlightenment, the French Revolution, this will be today's topic on the Modern World History course. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the World History Course. I am your professor, Philippe Girard. The 18th century, that is known in France as the Siècle des Lumières, or in English, the Enlightenment, as if light was shining into every aspect of human existence. So what is the Enlightenment? Well, first, it's an intellectual movement known for scientific curiosity. And if you're watching this video because you want to know everything about the history of the world, then congratulations, you are a product of the Enlightenment. Instead of just accepting things the way they were, Enlightenment philosophers looked for the cause behind everything, not through religion, God, revelation. No, they wanted to explain the world through science, through reason. And reason, that was a buzzword of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment wished to study a society that was imperfect and chaotic and then organize it in a way that made sense, either by classifying everything, taxonomy in biology was very popular, or through architecture building perfect cities shaped like a circle with radiating avenues because everything had to be based on geometry and order. But more than anything, even more than reason or science or architecture, the philosophers of the Enlightenment, they were interested in political philosophy, which simply means how do you organize your government? And here are the two main questions that you need to answer if you are a political philosopher. At first, where does sovereignty reside? Why does this person get to make the rules for everybody else? Why is he in charge? Question number two, once a person has power, what is the extent of that power? Is that power absolute or is that power governed by rules? And these questions had been raised before. You, call them, you can go back to the lecture on ancient Greece that I did for the early part of the World History course. And there you can learn about what Aristotle had to say about the nature of politics. But as of the 18th century, which is our time period for today, the dominant political system in France and most of Europe was absolute monarchy by divine right. So let me break it down based on our two questions. So first, who had the power in an absolute monarchy by divine right? Well, monarchy, so a king. And where did that king get his power? Well, by birth, that king belonged to a royal dynasty, the Bourbon in France, but ultimately that power came from God, the king claimed to rule by divine right. So it was a top-down system where God came first, and then the king, and then the ability all the way back to uh, commoners at the bottom. So what about the second issue, the limits to that power? Well, the answer was none. That was an absolute monarchy by divine right. So the king could pass a law on his own, that was called an edict, E-D-I-C-T, uh, without a parliament voting on it, and he would just write, we, the king, with the sixteens, by the grace of God, we decide that so-and-so. The end. No parliament involved. And if a person broke that law, uh, the king of France, he was in charge of the courts, too. So if he wanted to, he could just send anybody to prison, like the Bastille prison in Paris. And he did not even need a reason. He would just simply sign a lettre de cachet, a simple letter, and then he could send the person to prison indefinitely. The king was also the head of the executive branch running the country day to day, either in person or by appointing cabinet members. So laws, justice, executive power, the king could do everything. Absolute monarchy. There was an alternate system in England that was called constitutional monarchy. Uh, power in England still resided in the hands of a king who got it from birth and who was the head of uh, the Church of England, so a kind of divine monarchy too. But in England, the king's powers uh, would be limited by the rights of habeas corpus, 
the courts, and then ultimately Parliament. So the King of England was not all-powerful. Uh, people still had the right to a trial by jury, for example. And if he wanted to raise taxes, uh, the king had to ask Parliament first. So these were the two main alternatives in 18th century Europe, either British constitutional monarchy or French absolute monarchy. In France, which is our topic for today, absolute monarchy by divine right, that came under fire in the 18th century as part of that movement, the Enlightenment. Uh, some of the great philosophers of the Enlightenment were British, like John Locke, but today we're focusing on the French Revolution, so let's stick to the, the French thinkers, or at least French-speaking thinkers, because I will throw in a Swiss guy in the process. One of the great thinkers of that era was Montesquieu. Uh, he was kind of a boring person, a lawyer from the southwest of France, a member of the bourgeoisie, but he was also the author of a key book called De l'Esprit des Lois, The Spirit of the Laws. The book's main theory is that there are three ways that government is exercised. Uh, you can either pass laws, and that's the legislative power, or you can implement those laws, and that's the executive power, or you can punish people who broke the law, and that's judicial power. Does that sound familiar? Think about it for a sec. If you're an American student, these concepts should have been drilled into you in school because they are the basis for the three branches of government in the U.S. Constitution. Well. That notion came from the book, uh, The Spirit of the Laws by Montesquieu. In an ideal world, those three branches of government, they would be in different hands, because if they were in one set of hands, which was the case in France, then there would be no limit to what the king could do, complete tyranny. So Montesquieu called for a separation of powers, or a balance of powers, which again, became the basis, uh, that became the basis for the US Constitution. So a very influential writer, that Montesquieu. What about now Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the Swiss guy on our list? He was from Geneva, Switzerland, but he spoke French, and he, spoke, he spent most of his life in France, so I will claim him as a member of the French Enlightenment. His private life, that was much more interesting than Montesquieu's. He was a bit of a bad boy, actually. But also a humanist who published on just about every topic you can think of. Uh, he was a great novelist, for example. He wrote a novel called La Nouvelle Héloïse, which helped launch the whole Romantic period in European literature. And he was also a pedagogue. He wrote a treatise on education called Emile. And the basic premise, uh, premise of that book uh, it was to move away from rote learning. Uh, the way people learned before, who saw was that somebody would give a lecture, I guess, like what I'm, like what I'm doing today, and then kids would memorize a bunch of facts and recite them. And also kids would be considered no different from an adult, just smaller and younger versions of adults. And then came Rousseau in Emile, uh, who said, no, kids are different. Uh, you have to speak to them in a different way. There's a psychology on how you talk to children. And also, education is not just about memorizing facts. It's about uncovering them for yourself. So education, instead of rote learning, that should be based on dialogue. And again, I'll direct you to the video lecture I did on ancient Athens, because uh, Rousseau's views on pedagogy, they were derived from the Socratic dialogue back in ancient Greece. Emile, that was a very influential book. Uh, actually, a lot of educational series today are based on it. Though ironically, Rousseau, in his private life, he was not the best father. He knocked up the woman who washed his clothes five times, and then he abandoned all five kids and sent them to an orphanage. Uh, so the expert on educational methods, he was a deadbeat dad. No comment. But for our purposes today, Rousseau's key book was the Contrat Social, the Social Contract, which is about political philosophy and specifically the question, where does sovereignty reside? Instead of a king or God, Rousseau argued that sovereignty came from the popular will, la volonté générale, meaning the people, the nation, you and me. So pause the video again and ask yourself, did that idea have some influence in the way US democracy was devised? Well, yes, U.S. democracy is founded on the general will, government by the people, of the people, for the people. That goes back to Rousseau. The second question, should there be limits to a government's power in the democracy? Well, no, according to Rousseau, because once you have a system that is democratic and fair, then you should not limit the power of that people. So if you read the social contract by Rousseau, there's a concern in it that the popular will that could lead to a tyranny of a different sort, the tyranny of the majority. For that reason, Rousseau thought that democracy would work better in a small polity 
uh, like the counties of the Swiss Confederation, which is where he came from. But a big country like France, the most populated in Western Europe at the time, a single person would be drowned in the mass of voters and tyranny. Uh, that was a real risk, for the minority at least. Yet another great thinker, and this one is French, uh, was a man called Jean-Marie Arouet, who is better known by his pen name of Voltaire. He was another bad boy. Let me explain. Uh, it's always hard to make a living as a philosopher, but especially in the 18th century when the notion of copyright was just being invented. Uh, so publishing books was not a moneymaker. Instead, philosophers like Voltaire, they would try to find a patron, like a rich, noble woman. And why would she need to hire a philosopher, you might ask? Well, because she needed somebody to entertain her guests. It was common at the time for a high-born lady to invite her friends once a week on a Tuesday, and then hire a musician to play the piano, or sing, or even better, add a philosopher on retainer who would organize debates on all the great topics of the Enlightenment. This way you could, where you could have a deep conversations with your friends, uh, not just meaningless chit-chat. Remember, it's the Enlightenment period. That practice was known as a salon, S-A-L-O-N. Uh, it's a French word for a living room, the area where you invite your guests, and then by extension, uh, the weekly gatherings where people talked philosophy in the 18th century. So the idea of the Enlightenment, they were born in the living room of the nobles, and those nobles, they were eventually toppled by the French Revolution. And there's a bit of irony in that. So Voltaire, he would have a patron, a noble, and then invariably he would have an affair with the wife of his patron, because he was a womanizer, or he would get into a verbal fight with that patron, because he was a loud mouse. And then Voltaire would get kicked out and start the process again at the house of another noble, another patron. And I'm talking rich and powerful patrons like Frederick, the King of Prussia, or Catherine the Great of Russia. Voltaire also made plenty of enemies due to his wit. And you did not want to be an enemy of Voltaire because he could destroy you with an epigram, a short, nasty poem. My favorite one was aimed at a rival named Jean Fréron. Uh, it's kind of off topic, but I'll put it on the screen when I edit the video. Also, uh, if you're interested about wit, uh, I recommend watching the movie Ridicule, uh, which is a, uh, really great. And it's about the, the world of wit and the salon in the run-up to the French Revolution. Voltaire is a big hero in there. So because of his wit, uh, Voltaire often offended the wrong person, and then he got into trouble. And then his books would be censored, or he would be sent to the Bastille prison by the king, uh, which happened twice to him. So for that reason, Voltaire developed a lifelong hatred of tyranny, intolerance, and any limits on free speech. And he wrote a lot, including satirical novels like Candide, which is probably his uh, most famous work today. That novel, which you can read, it's pretty short and funny, uh, that novel poked fun at everybody, Germans, Jews, women, but mostly at religious intolerance, especially when it came from the Catholic Church. So as you're writing down your notes, you're probably wondering, what was the big idea of Voltaire? What is the one thing I need to remember about him? Well, freedom of speech and religious tolerance. Uh, he complained how, due to the power of the Catholic Church in France, other religions, uh, religions like uh, Judaism and Protestantism, they were persecuted. And that was a famous case in the city of Toulouse, where a young man called Calas uh, was killed, and everybody immediately suspected the father for the murder, uh, not for any evidence, just because the father was a Protestant minority in France. The evidence against the dad was very thin, but the father was tortured to force him to confess, which was legal under French law at the time, and then he was sentenced to death by being broken on the wheel, which is a horrible way to die, though again, legal in France before the revolution. So for Voltaire, the Calas affair, that was a very example of all that was wrong about France at that time. A person was framed because of religious intolerance, because he was a Protestant, and then he was subjected to all the horrors of 18th century justice. So what Voltaire would have done if he had had a magic wand? Uh, well, probably a system like English constitutional monarchy. Some king, some established church promote order among the populace, but also limits on that power. A constitution, a parliament, basic freedoms, especially freedom of speech and religion. That would be the time to pause the video again and ask yourself, which part of the US constitution do you think was inspired by the philosophy of Voltaire? Hmm? Well, the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, of course, freedom of speech, the press, assembly, and religion, my favorite amendment. So now let's take a deep 
tool quickly through another figure of the French Enlightenment, the Marquis de Sade, who was also a bad boy. Uh, he was a noble, a marquis, and he was known for his deviant sexuality. In fact, in S and M, the S comes from him, sadomasochistic practices. They're named after the Marquis de Sade. Uh, so he wrote erotic novels about the pleasure that he derived from inflicting pain on his servants, mostly. Not the nicest guy. His practices, in fact, were so deviant uh, that he was sent to the Bastille prison. And in fact, he was in that prison just before that was attacked in July of 1789. We'll get back to it in a second. And one of the erotic novels that he had written while in prison on a tiny strip of paper uh, was hidden inside his cell. And that was later recovered uh, from the ruins of the Bastille, which is kind of neat. So anyway, I classify the Marquis de Sade as a figure of the Enlightenment because he advocated sexual freedom, uh, but for himself, not necessarily for his poor servants. Yet another figure of the Enlightenment, and a more traditional one, would be Diderot and then his friend D'Alembert. And those two got the idea of gathering all the knowledge of the world in a set of books, which they called an encyclopedia. They would summarize all the knowledge of their time, which was a classic Enlightenment project. Gather up knowledge and then organize it logically from A to Z. Their encyclopedia was not just about factual knowledge, it could be quite political too. So the entry on, I don't know, slavery, uh, that didn't just list statistics on the number of slaves in French Haiti, for example, but that entry also debated whether slavery was moral from a philosophical perspective. Answer, no. Uh, and because it promoted dangerous progressive ideas, the encyclopedia ran into problems of censorship because in absolutist France, there was no freedom of the press, uh, the Catholic Church and the king had the right to put a book on the index of forbidden books and then ban it. And so the encyclopedia was eventually published in Holland, I believe. So liberty, freedom, that was the central idea of the Enlightenment. Which begs the question, what about slavery? After all, we saw in previous videos that the Atlantic slave trade, the very antithesis of, slavery, uh, of liberty, that peaked in the 18th century, at the very same time that the Enlightenment was in full sway. So what did Enlightenment philosophers have to say about the enslavement of Africans? And the answer is, not so much. Enlightenment philosophers, they were generally against slavery, but they devoted fairly little space in their works to that topic. I mentioned Voltaire's book Candide, for example. Well, there's a passage in it where Candide stops in the slave uh, colony of Suriname in South America, and there he encounters a slave who's been horribly treated by his masters. But it's just one page in one book in a huge body of work by Voltaire. Remember that philosophers were upper middle class white men from Europe, so slavery wasn't exactly front and center for them. France, the only group that was really active against slavery, was the Société des Amis des Noirs, the Society of the Friends of the Blacks, uh, which was founded in 1788. But that group was quite small, and its main focus was the abolition of the slave trade, not slavery itself, because for emancipation, uh, that sounded too radical at the time, even for that small abolitionist movement in Paris. There was a more active abolitionist movement in the British Enlightenment, and some of these British writers who opposed slavery because, did so because they thought it was a violation of the rights of men from an idealistic perspective. In the previous video, I talked about Olodai Cuyano, uh, whose autobiography recounted his experiences as a former slave and who became a leading spokesman against slavery in the late 18th century in Britain because he thought, well, we black people are men too, uh, the rights of men. And later in this section, we'll also talk about the Industrial Revolution in Britain, and the main thinker there will be Adam Smith, uh, the one who devised the whole idea of capitalism. And Smith uh, also opposed slavery, uh, not so much on idealistic ground, but more on economic grounds, because he saw that slavery was an inefficient form of labor, uh, whereas he preferred free markets uh, to develop one's economy. So the, there were more people against slavery in Britain. We'll get back to it when you study the Haitian Revolution uh, in the Caribbean. All right, well, that's a lot of ideas, so let's stop here. Remember the basic ideas for that first uh, slide. Uh, the separation of powers, Montesquieu. The general will, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Freedom of speech and religious tolerance, Voltaire. Gathering, questioning knowledge, the encyclopedia. And then the background, uh, sexual freedom, the Marquis de Sade, or racial equality, the society of the friends of the blacks. Put all of these together and you have all the intellectual tools necessary to challenge absolute monarchy by divine right. Which is what happened next. The books of the Enlightenment, they were the basis for the real life revolutions of the late 18th century, first in the US and then in France and later Haiti 
in Latin America. Let's spend a few minutes on the first of these revolutions, the American one, but very briefly because this is not a US history course. As I'm sure you know, the rallying cry of that revolution was no taxation without representation, which is to say people who lived in British colonies in North America, they complained that they had to pay taxes on tea or other products, even though those colonies had no representatives in the British Parliament that had voted to authorize those taxes. So the solution there would be to declare independence, as the colonists did in 1776, and then institute self-government so that they could vote on their own taxes and their own laws, all of which should remind you a lot of Rousseau and the general will. Later on, the two main texts of the American Revolution, they were similarly inspired by the Enlightenment. Uh, if you look at the US Declaration of Independence, uh, which is in your primary source reader, that is again based on the notion of self-government and the popular will. Also, as for the US Constitution in 87, uh, that enshrined the separation of powers. And then the Bill of Rights attached to that constitution that protected freedom of speech and freedom of religion. So a lot of ideas derived from Locke and Rousseau and Montesquieu in that constitution. One issue that will pop up as we survey the French and Haitian Revolution will be how far did those two revolutions go in terms of furthering liberty and equality for all? Well, as far as the American Revolution goes, not so far. Uh, personally, I prefer to call it the US War of Independence because I don't think it was a true revolution that changed US society all the way from the top to the bottom. In the end, rich white men from the colonies were in charge instead of rich white men from England. Nothing revolutionary there, just independence. White indentured servitude disappeared during that period, which was a step forward. Uh, but poor white men generally did not get the right to vote until the Jacksonian era, which is in the 1820s. Slavery remained until the Civil War, and in fact the Constitution counted black people at three-fifths of a human being uh, for census purposes. And women did not get the right to vote until the 19th Amendment in 1920. So a very incomplete revolution, uh, which only took the principles of the Enlightenment so far. The American Revolution, however, had a major impact on the two revolutions that we'll study next, the French and the Haitian ones in part because of personal connections. France fought in the US War of Independence, as did soldiers from the French colony of Haiti. Uh, so various people who participated in the American Revolution, uh, they were later involved in the French Revolution, such as the famous Marquis de Lafayette. So don't be surprised if ideas jump from America to France and later Haiti. We're often talking about the same people. Uh, the French Declaration of the Rights of Men, for example, that was mostly written by Lafayette, a veteran of the U.S. War of Independence, and also Thomas Jefferson, the author of the U.S. Declaration of Independence, uh, who later was a U.S. ambassador in Paris by 1789. Which is why we're talking about the Age of Atlantic Revolutions. All of these revolutions are connected. What the American Revolution also did was to prove that it was possible to create a democracy. Many conservative thinkers in the 18th century thought that democracy was a nice idea, but that it could not work in practice. If you let the people do whatever they wanted, then society would explode. It would be mob rule. The king and the church, they were not perfect, but at least they kept uh, the, the populace in check. Well, the American Revolution happened. Everybody expected chaos, and instead, US democracy functioned pretty well. So it was proved that democracy could exist in practice, not just in books. Yet another consequence of the American Revolution was that it bankrupted the French government. France helped win the war against Britain, but the cost of the war was so enormous that it added to all the financial problems that uh, were faced by France in the run-up to our main topic for today, the French Revolution. So on to the third slide on the French Revolution now, starting with a big question. Why did it start? Why in France? Why 1789? Plenty of reasons as it happened. Let's go through them. The first reason, as mentioned earlier, was financial. The French government had a huge national debt. And things got so bad that by 1789, the bulk of government money was spent not on defense or education or roads, but on servicing the debt. Not reimbursing it, mind you, just paying interest on it, which clearly was not a sustainable situation in the long run. So when you broke like that, two solutions. Uh, either you lower expenses, i.e. you cut down on the army, or reduce the lifestyle of the king and the queen in Versailles. Not popular with a party girl like Marie Antoinette. Uh, by the way, watch the movie by Sofia Coppola on her, it's pretty good. Or if you don't want to lower expenses, solution number two, raise taxes. 
And here we run into the second long-term reason for the, for the French Revolution, and that is social inequality and an inefficient tax system. France back then was divided into three estates, and an estate that would be like a social class today. The first estate was the clergy, priests, and so forth. So the main role was to maintain bird records and pray and the like. Clergymen, they did not pay taxes, even though the Catholic Church was extremely rich. The second estate, that was the nobility, dukes, kings, earls, etc. Their main duty was to administer justice, to fight in wars, and generally rule France like the king did. And they too were very rich, and they too did not pay taxes. That was called the privileges of the clergy and the nobility. Everybody else, like me or you, would belong to the third estate. And that's about 97% of the population. Some members of the third estate were wealthy lawyers or merchants in the city, what was called the, the bourgeoisie, the prosperous middle class from the, the city. Uh, but most in the third estate were peasants, or in some cases, the urban working class. And yet, those poor people, uh, they were the main tax base for France. So you're not taxing the rich, just the poor. Not a very efficient way to finance your budget. Those taxes were not equally distributed either. It had to do with the way the French nation had been built over the centuries. So some regions like Bretagne had been acquired by marriage and then others by conquest. Uh, and the laws from each region had been kept intact after the conquest according to local custom. So it was kind of a patchwork, legally speaking. And so even though it was the same country, France, the, the law was not the same if you lived in Bretagne or Guyenne or Provence. And that included tax law. An example would be the, the major tax, the tax on salt, the gabelle, which varied by a factor of 1 to 10 or even 100, meaning that if you lived in that village and then you went 10 miles away across the invisible border with the next province, uh, then the price of salt might be double or triple or more. So that led to a lot of smuggling and discontent. Uh, as a side note, if you see terms in brackets on the PowerPoint slide, that means that you don't have to memorize that term for the quiz. I'm just trying not to overwhelm you with stuff. Beyond that, uh, getting back to the causes for the revolution, in 1787-88, just before the revolution, the grain harvests were bad, which cut into the farmer's income, uh, and so they weren't angry about that. And also the result, the price of bread skyrocketed, and that was a major issue for the working class in Paris, because they lived on a fixed income. So not surprisingly, these working poor, they were the same people who later showed up on the barricades. They were simply hungry. Those urban poor uh, were called back then the sans-culottes, which always made me chuckle as a kid. In modern French, a culotte, that's underwear. So I saw that these revolutionaries wore no underwear. Chuckle. As it turned out in the 18th century, a culotte, that meant knee breeches, the fancy clothes of the nobility. Uh, so the sans-culottes, they were the people who wore regular pants, not the knee breeches, so they were the common folk, the sans -culotte. So if you had to summarize the causes of the French Revolution, then that would be a combination of things. In the long run, the ideas of enlightenment, the example set by the American Revolution, the financial crisis, inequality between nobles and the third estate, and in the short term, the bad grain harvest. And all those trends came together in 1789 when the French king, Louis XVI, he had the genius idea of calling for a meeting of the Estates General. So what the heck is that, you might ask? Well, the Estates General were an old institution, a parliament, like the US Congress in a way, uh, because it included representatives from all the parts of France who would be elected to give some advice to the king. And that system was so contrary to the notion of absolute monarchy by divine right that in fact he had not been summoned for over 100 years. But King Louis XVI, he was indecisive, so when he was faced with a fiscal crisis, instead of saying, I'm the king, I can do anything I want, let's just tax the church and the nobles, or whatever the solution is, instead he threw up his hand in the air and he said, I can't solve the financial crisis by myself, let's summon the Estates General to do it for me. And the way the Estates General functioned is that each estate elected its own representatives. So 300 deputies from the clergy, 300 from the nobility, and then 600 from the third estate, which was unfair since the clergy only represented 1% of the population, uh, nobles about 2%, and the third estate 97% of the population, and yet somehow the breakdown of deputies was 300, 300, and 600. When people all over France elected the deputies, uh, they also usually drafted cahiers de doléances, letters of grievances in English 
set of instructions to the deputy explaining, well, when you get to Versailles as a representative of the uh, third state, here is what you should really change. And dozens of these cahiers have survived, so we can know the state of French public opinion as of 1789 and what people wanted, which is cool. And mostly they wanted the ideas from the Enlightenment, like equal taxation, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and so forth. And a handful of these cahiers also criticized uh, slavery as well. So after being elected, those deputies met on May 5th, 1789, the Palace of Versailles, the Palace of the King. And from the get-go, there was a big dispute over procedure. I already mentioned how the third estate only had 600 deputies, same as the other two estates combined, even though they represented far more constituents. Well, making things even worse, uh, the deputies would vote by estate. Let's say you introduce a bill that says we should tax everybody in France equally. Well, obviously the members of the clergy would vote against it because they had a privilege of not paying taxes, and the nobility would do the same for the same reason, and the third estate, which paid taxes, uh, would want equal taxation. So two votes against and one for. And so the deputies of the third estate who represented the bulk of the French nation, they would always be defeated two to one because they voted by estate. And that was a very unfair system, which led to the revolution. So now let's move on to the good stuff, to the barricades. Well, in June of 1789, the deputies of the third estate complained, we'll always be outvoted down two to one if we vote by a state, so why don't we all gather up the deputies in a single assembly with all the deputies bunched up together? And if we add up all 600 deputies of the third estate, plus a handful of liberal clergymen and nobles who agree uh, to join us, uh, then the third estate will have a majority of a total of 1,200 uh, to pass important reforms. So the deputies of the Estates General, they went to Paris to a tennis court, and there they created a new parliament to represent the nation which they call the National Assembly. And again, back to Rousseau and the notion of the popular will, the National Assembly. Deputies, they also made an oath that day that they would not disband until they had drafted a constitution for France, i.e. they would set up a constitutional monarchy like England, where the king's powers would be limited, not absolute, because they would, be, they would be limited by a constitution. In the meantime, there was a more down-to-earth revolution of all the hungry farmers in the provinces, all the hungry sans-culottes in the streets of Paris, women included, uh, who attacked castles with pitchforks, demanding liberty, equality, and more bread. Some of those sans-culottes, they decided to attack the Bastille prison, because that was a symbol of royal oppression. And also the mob hoped to seize the weapons that were stored there on the premises. That attack was on July 14, 1789, the official starting point for the French Revolution, and the origins of the national holiday of France, Bastille Day. Right now it's 2021 and we're in the middle of a pandemic, so traveling is hard, uh, but once things finally go back to normal, if you go to Paris on Bastille Day, you're going to have a lot of fun. First, you'll have a big military parade in the morning on the Champs-Élysées. Then there will be a garden party at the Élysée Palace in the afternoon, assuming that you're invited by the president. And then at night, in every town in France, you'll have a big fireworks display and then a ball where you can dance the night away under the stars to the sounds of some very kitschy music from the 80s. Pretty fun. The one thing you cannot do on Bastille Day is to see the actual prison, because it was destroyed in 1789. I mean, like, every single stone. But people still regularly do demonstrations on the sites of the old prison, because that's the symbol of revolution, and because French people love to go on strike. But back to 1789. On August 4th of that year, the National Assembly gathered up again to look at the issue of privileges, the fact that the clergy and the nobility, they were not paying taxes. And they decided something simple, let's abolish all privileges. From now on, whether you're a descendant of a peasant like myself, or from a noble, or from a priest somehow, you would have the same rights and duties, and you would pay the same taxes. And that was quite impressive already. Uh, but two weeks after the night of August 4th, uh, the deputies gathered up for something even more impressive. They passed the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. That document is important, but short. Just one preamble, and then 17 brief articles. It could fit on a single piece of paper, so it became a, like the Ten Commandments of the French Revolution that was printed and spread all over Europe and all the way into your workbook. However short, that document had profound implications. I especially like Article 1, which summarized all the ideas of the Enlightenment into one sentence. Les hommes naissent et demeurent libres et égaux. 
Men are born and remain free and equal in rights. So are there nobles and commoners? No, people are all equal. They're born that way. So no more estates or social classes. Does that mean communism, that everybody should have full income equality? No, men are equal in rights. They all have the same shot at success, and then some will thrive or fail, but based on merit alone, not birth. So you could have social inequality, that's a revolution, but as long as they were based on merit. And that had profound implications too. Uh, 18th century armies were composed of mercenaries led by noble officers, who became generals because they were well born. But the French Revolutionary Army, that became composed of volunteers and draftees, because now people fought for their country, for the nation. And it was led by officers, selected for their talent on the battlefield, not because of their birth. So people like Napoleon Bonaparte, for example. Ultimately, this merit-based society led to the decline of the nobility in France, and the rise of smart, up-and-coming commoners, the lawyers, the merchants, the businessmen. And that's why the 19th century was the era of the bourgeoisie. We'll get back to it when we study the Industrial Revolution. Other articles of the Declaration, they also had profound consequences. Uh, take the preamble, the introduction. One of the key questions of the Enlightenment had been where does sovereignty reside? The king or the general will? Well, the preamble stated that the Declaration was passed by the representative of the French people organized as a national assembly. So, the popular will. A second question had been are there limits to the power of the king? Well, the Declaration went on to list all sorts of natural and imprescriptible rights of man, meaning basic freedoms like the freedom of speech that no one, not even the king, could ever take away. They were inalienable. So, how do you think the king reacted to all this? What would you have done if you were Louis XVI? Well, ultimately the events of 1789 went directly against absolute monarchy by divine right. So in 1792, Louis XVI tried to flee the country to seek military help from foreign powers like Austria to undo the revolution. But he was caught on the way to the border and brought back to Paris and eventually put on trial for well, treason. And then famously was sent to the guillotine in January of 1793. So that brought the French Revolution much further than the philosophers had expected, not just a constitutional monarchy, but a republic, a government without a king. As a result, most major monarchies of Europe declared war on France to snuff out this radical experiment with republican government. In response, the revolution uh, radicalized itself, and a period known as the Terror began, where every enemy of the revolution, real or alleged, uh, was put on trial and executed. And granted, the methods of execution were more merciful. Uh, the revolution abolished torture and cruel forms of punishment and replaced them with the trial by jury and the guillotine. But there was still something terrifying about labeling entire groups like nobles or conservative peasants from the Vendée region, uh, the Chouan, not just as criminals, but as counter revolutionaries, enemies of people who should be wiped out from the face of the earth and guillotined or drowned in mass. In the end, the French armies prevailed against all the monarchies of Europe and saved the revolution. But then something ought to happen. The revolution started moving back to the political center, away from extremism, uh, like a planet that would have uh, orbited around the sun, gone all the way to the other extreme, and then back to its starting point, an astronomical revolution in that case. After the terror ended, a more conservative regime took over, uh, the Directoire, and then in 1799, France was taken over by Napoleon Bonaparte, a military dictator who replaced the popular will with a cult of personality and who ruled with few counterpowers. So, so much of the revolution. Uh, some achievements remain, uh, but uh, there was a lot of step back. Which brings us to the final question I want to cover today. How much did the French Revolution actually change in the long run? Clearly, it went much further than its American counterpart. The US rebels never sent George III to the guillotine, for example. But when the dust settled, how much was different with French society after uh, the revolution? Was it a, a true revolution that changed society from top to bottom? The answer is a lot, but not everything. Cup half full. So let's start with simple, tangible changes. Remember how the Enlightenment aimed to create an orderly society based on reason and science? Well, France used to have a patchwork of units like acres and feet and pounds, which varied from town to town, so it was a logistical nightmare. And instead, the revolution set up a universal system of measurements, the metric system, that may be the single most important legacy of the French Revolution. 
like 70 US, where people still cling to those annoying pounds per square inch in the imperial system. If you're a fan of the metric system, as I am, go on a pilgrimage to the Pavilion of Measurements in the city of Sèvres, just outside of Paris, where you can see the original version of the meter and the kilogram. Very cool, at least in a nerdy sort of way. And there was even an attempt during the revolution to set up a calendar based on the metric system. So weeks now became 10 days long, not seven, and the calendar would be secular, not religious, because of the separation of church and state. So instead of beginning with the birth of Jesus, the new calendar began with the French Revolution, a new era. And every day was named after common items like pumpkins or hemp, instead of Catholic saints. Uh, but unfortunately, the solar year is 365 days plus change, and the lunar month is 29 days plus change. So time does not lend itself well to a base 10 system. And the Republican calendar was almost as complicated as a Gregorian calendar they was trying to replace, and it didn't stick in the long run. The rest of the metric system did. The laws of France they also varied based on local customs and estates. So during the revolution, all these laws were replaced by a single law that applied equally to every person in every region of France. What eventually became the Civil Code, also known as the Napoleonic Code. And I mention it because of all right here in Louisiana that is derived from the French Civil Code and so ultimately from the revolution. So if you ever wondered why in Louisiana here a parent cannot disinherit a child, that's because of the French Civil Code and because of that notion from the Revolution that you should not give more to one child just because he happens to be the firstborn son. Remember, all men are created free and equal in rights. It goes back to the Declaration of Rights of Men. Actually, let's focus on that expression some more. All men are created free and equal in rights. Who does that apply to? Rich men? Educated men or all men, even the poor. And we always saw how the nobility lost its special rights, its privileges in August of 1799. So all men of all social classes. But would everybody get to vote, even the poor? Uh, the French Revolution went back and forth on that point because the educated bourgeoisie, they looked down upon the peasants and the urban poor, uh, the other members of the third estate, and that bourgeoisie was afraid of mob rule if the poor got the right to vote. So ultimately, it was not until 1848 that everybody in France got to vote for good, regardless of income, universal suffrage. What about Jewish people or other religious minorities? Did the revolution apply to all men or just all Christian men? Before the revolution, Jews had been allowed to stay in France, but more as guests than true citizens, even if they had lived there in France for a generation. So in the early French Revolution, a priest named Henri Grégoire, uh, he took up the Jewish cause of equality, even though he was a, a Catholic himself. And Grégoire also campaigned for racial equality as part of the Society of the Friends of the Blacks. Well, that priest, Abbé Grégoire, he saw Jewish emancipation as a logical consequence of the concept of freedom of religion. It took a couple of years, but by 1791, the National Assembly agreed with him uh, that Jews were indeed French citizens like anybody else which might seem obvious to us today, uh, but religious, uh, religious equality, that was not obvious at the time. In most European countries, Jews were still treated as second-class citizens. And the French Revolution changed that in France and throughout Europe. Next question, what about women? Did the expression, all men are created equal in rights, apply to all of mankind, women included, or just males? The original French language in the Declaration of the Rights of Men was kind of ambiguous. In part, well, because all the deputies who had voted on that text were men, so the issue had never really crossed their mind. And that's where Olympe de Gouges came in. She was the illegitimate daughter of a noble, at least she claimed to be, and she had been widowed very early on and then had moved to Paris to start a career as a playwright and a woman of letters. When the revolution began, uh, she took the Declaration of the Rights of Men and she wrote it to specifically include men and women has been created free and equal in rights for gender equality. I have a podcast in the Women's History Playlist if you want to learn more about her fascinating life. But long story short, she ended her career on the guillotine, a martyr of the feminist movement. So that was a major blank spot of the revolution. It did not lead to gender equality in France. In fact, French women did not get the right to vote until the end of World War II. 
What about people of color? Remember from section one that France had colonies in the Caribbean? So there were a lot of people of color in French colonies and then quite a few in France itself. So if men were all free and equal, did that mean that slaves should be freed? And if all men were free and equal, did that mean that racial discrimination should end? Did the equation apply to all white men or all men in general? Were black people men, basically? Well, we'll get back to this issue in detail in the next lecture on the Haitian Revolution, but basically after some years of equivocation, under pressure from the Haitian slave revolt, uh, the French parliament finally abolished slavery and granted citizenship to all people of color by 1794, uh, which was a major step forward for people of color. Uh, let me just mention as an example Alex Dumas, who was a mixed-race son of a white planter in Haiti and is black slave. Well, Dumas uh, moved to Paris, uh, to Paris, and then during the revolution he joined the French army and went up the ranks based on merits, that's a new rule, and he ended up as a division general, even though he was mixed race. And by the way, he also had a son, Alexandre Dumas, uh, who is the author of The Three Musketeers and the Count of Monte Cristo, uh, famous novels. So upward social mobility, that was possible for people of color, like the Dumas family in the 1790s. So in terms of racial equality, the French Revolution went way further than the American Revolution ever did. At least for a while, because we'll see in the next lecture that uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, after he rose to power in 1799, uh, he restored slavery in some French colonies and reneged on a lot of uh, aspects of racial equality. Well, there's obviously far more to say about the French Revolution and what it achieved, but let's end it here and cycle back to our initial question. Where does sovereignty reside? In the French case, the answer is, it's complicated. Uh, commoners, i.e. non-nobles, they became citizens in 1789, and Jews were seven, uh, citizens after 1791. Slaves in the colonies, they were citizens after 1794, the law of abolition, at least until Napoleon got to power. Poor people, that was kind of on and off until 1848 when universal suffrage became permanent in France. Women, uh, they didn't get the right to vote until 1944, so a cup half full as far as who truly was a citizen of France. What about the second question? What are limits to that sovereignty? Well, by 1789, French citizens had some inalienable rights, like freedom of speech and freedom of religion, that were protected for them uh, and protected them from the abuses by the state. The one problem, paradoxically, was that the new French government uh, was much more legitimate than the old monarchy of yore. And what I mean is that uh, when the king was in charge, you could always ignore his edicts, his laws, by saying that they were just like the, the, the dictates of a tyrant. But when the law was passed by a national assembly, that was the embodiment of the nation, breaking the law, that became a much graver crime. Which explains why after the initial idealistic period that was all about liberty, equality, and fraternity, around 1789, uh, the revolution descended into a violent phase in 1793 when the terror targeted enemies uh, who were labeled as counter-revolutionaries with a kind of fanaticism that is the hallmark of ideological wars. That kind of over-the-top rhetoric, enemies of the people, uh, that would be recycled by Nazis and communists in the 20th century. So in a way, the intellectual roots of modern genocides can be traced back to the days of the terror, at least indirectly. Critics of the Enlightenment, they also warned that without institutions like monarchy and the church, a democracy would descend into chaos and mob rule. And indeed, there was some of that. In the 1790s, France went through multiple regimes, the Constituante, the Convention, the Directoire, and all that to end under the rule of a populist dictator, Napoleon, who manipulated the mob to retain power. But I don't want to minimize the many achievements of the French Revolution, uh, because without the French Revolution, I would probably be a peasant somewhere, paying feudal dues to some stupid local lord, and measuring my field with some stupid units like acres. The French Revolution that opened the door to atrocities like the war against the Chouan and the Vendée, uh, but also made possible things that were unthinkable before. The rights of men, the end of monarchy, citizenship for Jews, and universal suffrage. Speaking of unthinkable things, what about a revolution that would actually end slavery for good and then create a political system led not by white planners, as in the US, or rich white bourgeois in France, but by former black slaves? Would that be possible? We'll see it next time as we study the most radical of the revolution on our list, 
the Haitian Revolution. Goodbye. Au revoir.